Welcome to the uh, Liberty Baptist Church in our 8.30 time of worship. If you're a visitor, we're especially glad that you're here today. There is a card in the pew in front of you that says welcome. We'd love for you to take a few moments and fill that card out. You can put it in our offering plate or give it to one of our ushers, but we are indeed glad that you're visiting with us today. Well, there are a few things that I want to remind you of that are in your proclaimer uh, and in the vestibules. Uh, the first of which is um, we have, uh, it's a very special week this week. We are... Um, praying this week and we have uh, at easter time is the annie armstrong easter offering and uh, we do want to pray for our north american missionaries leading up to our annie armstrong uh, offering and i believe we have a video uh, talking a little bit about that so please do uh, direct your attention to the screens at this time Everybody on Ruckel Street always thought they were a bit strange. When we moved in, we had been told that it would take at least six months for anyone to really, really even have anything to do with us. They were a mom, a dad, a son, a son, a daughter, and a son. Uh, it's insanity. Well, do you know where you left your shoes? <laughs> there you go, give me that who chose to move into one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Indianapolis. We do hear gunshots, and there is crime. And are there, are there dangers? Yes. We trust God. Barry and Amy Rager brought their family here to plant a church. That's, that's why we moved to this neighborhood. And the recipe for doing that started with a recipe. Our second day here, it was February, and so nobody is outside, but uh, we wanted to meet people. My dirty oven, woohoo! Barry looked at me and he said, No one is going to open the door for us. And we said that if we take the kids, <laughs> who can say no to children holding a plate of cookies? And I thought, That's crazy. So it's probably what we need to do. That was the day everything began to change. Hey, we brought you some cookies. The first week, I made enough cookies for our whole block. Now, everyone on Ruckel Street knows the Ragers. And just acting unafraid has made the neighborhood trust us. Now, this is the perfect neighborhood to raise their children. I love you. We're excited that they get to, um, to watch this story unfold. And now there is a church that was started in the most unlikely of ways. The Spirit of God transforms us. Uh, it's all from cookies. God used that um, just small little act of generosity as a, a way to bridge cultures. With the a few Spirit years ago, Strange life. moved into the neighborhood. And now Ruckel Street is different. We believe that God is worthy to be known. All because of a few dozen cookies and your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We had no connections and we had no base for moving to Indianapolis. And so we would not have been able to move into our neighborhood. We would not have been able to do the things that we did without people giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, without um, the generosity of Southern Baptist to enable us to actually be here and do what we feel God has geared us to do and called us to do. Well, we would certainly uh, desire for you to pray for uh, the missionaries that are serving here in North America and also to consider giving towards the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And uh, if you would like to do so, please, uh, you can mark that and, and give it in your regular offering as well. Uh, also, something to remember is uh, that Easter is rapidly approaching, and so we have a flyer for you to, uh, to, for, to remind yourself of all that's going on and also to invite folks in your neighborhood uh, to the uh, Holy Week services and to our Easter service here at Liberty Baptist. Please do take some of these flyers. They are in the vestibules, and uh, give them out to anyone that you think might be interested in coming to 
uh, the Holy Week services and to our Easter service. Now, in preparation uh, for that, we are also going to have a um, the Egg Games Extravaganza, which is coming up uh, on the 26th. And uh, we have, uh, last year I kind of coined the term, or maybe a couple years ago coined the term, Operation Egg Fill, because it does take, uh, it does take a, a large effort to fill all of those eggs, some 15,000 eggs that we'll be giving away at the Egg Games. And uh, so if you want to fill uh, the eggs, we have candy and tape and eggs and even a bag for you to return your completed eggs in. We have those in prepackaged uh, paper bags and they are in the ministry center. So if you will make your way either between the services or after the 11 o'clock service uh, to the ministry center, to the welcome desk, I will make sure that you get as many of those bags as you want. I believe it's like 54 of those bags. And so if, uh, if just a few families will take those uh, some of those, then we can make sure to get that done uh, quickly and in time for the Egg Games extravaganza. The last thing that I'll mention is uh, the deacon recommendations. Uh, last week I mentioned that, and uh, this week is the last week for you to uh, fill out your deacon recommendations for those two ministries that uh, I mentioned last week, and you can put that in the uh, collection box here in the center vestibule or over in the ministry center on the welcome desk there is a, uh, a box for those deacon recommendations. A lot of great things going on, and our prayer is that you will be involved as God leads you. Amen. As we worship, God desires for us to open our hearts and our minds to Him. Let's stand together as we try to do that as we sing. Open our eyes, Lord. Let that be our prayer as we worship Him.
pray in this place and in these moments that we will in fact see you and encounter you. And God, you tell us that when we truly do see you for who you are, it demands of us a response. And so God, today as your word is shared and as we think about it, God, may we not just be hearers of the word. May we be doers of it also. And so, God, today, would you just till up the soil of our heart so that we would be sensitive to your spirit, that we would not sit week after week and listen to things from your word and do very little about them. God, may today in this place your word take root in our heart and may we produce fruit of discipleship. May we be like those uh, in the Gospels who when they look at us, God, we, they can see that we have in fact been with Jesus. And so God, today as we move ever close, closer to Easter Sunday and the uh, celebration of the resurrection, God, may we encounter you along the way. May we encounter you even in our midst today. God, we pray for some in our church who are struggling. Carmelita Hughes, we pray for her today. Glenda Gregg, we pray for her today. And God, we pray you would take these precious ladies and you would heal them. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God desires our lives. God desires our trust but more than anything. He desires our heart. This new song says, my heart is yours. Take it all. My heart, my life in your hands. Let's stand together. We'll sing through it one time and then I'll bring you in.
give you my life. I give you my trust, Jesus. For you are my God. You are enough, Jesus. Sing that with us. I give you my life. I give you my trust, Jesus. For you are my God. And you are today to study your word. Lord, you pray to be with Rusty today as he delivers a message and pray that we'll take it, take it to our hearts and go through this week and live a Christian life all week, not just on Sundays, Lord. Lord, we just pray for the people that the tornado victims that lost a lot of the things, Lord. We pray that you be with them and as they rebuild and pray that we as Christians will help them. And pray for the sick that Rusty mentioned today and others we don't know of. Pray to be with them and Get them back to health as I will. 
And Lord, we just pray if there's someone here today that needs to be saved, they still won't put it off, Lord, and come to get to know you today if they will. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord. And uh, pray as we take this offering, we use it for the ongoing of your kingdom. For this we ask in your name. Amen. You say you want to see me, then listen to that child's cry. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, my lips are parched and dry. My clothes are torn and dirty, I have no shoes to wear. You say you want to see me, then show them, show them that you care. You must cross over to the other side, away from all the comforts that hold If you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. Come with me to the other side. Cross over.
Well, if I were to ask many of you in the room today, most of you have a certain type of music that you like, and if you're not into music, many of you, I hope at least, have an author that you like to read. You know, oftentimes, if you listen to the music of an artist or listen to the words of an author, you can notice if you follow that particular musician or if you follow that particular author throughout their life, their music and their writing often changes. You just watch from where they start and trace their life. There's some continuity between what they have sung or what they have said throughout their life, but if you have a keen enough eye You can say, well, that's when he was young, that's when he was middle-aged, that's when he was old, that was when he was in a bright time, that was when he was in a dark time, and their music and their writing changes. You know, even music can be identified by era. If If we could put some music on right now, you could say, oh yeah, 1930s, oh yeah, 1960s, oh yeah, 1990s. A few of you, you understand? But, but each of you can identify, right, with a certain, uh, certain type that matches a certain era. Now, why do I say that? I wonder if we were able to let you listen to, to just bits of the teaching of Jesus, would you know when that teaching was taught? Very important question. Because you say, well, if you know generally the timeline of Jesus' ministry, you could connect certain teaching with certain events. But that's not what I'm saying today. There's certainly that. I'm not just saying the content. I'm asking you, could you identify the tone? Because throughout the teaching ministry of Jesus, Jesus' teaching tone 
changes. Now, here's the way it is. We've been traveling through the Gospels. We've been traveling through the life and ministry of Jesus. In many ways right now in the ministry of Jesus, he has preached many of his great sermons. He has done many of his great miracles. And at this point in his life, the crowds are running to him. The Galilean hillsides are full of people that are really spellbound by his teaching. They are mystified by his actions. And probably anywhere you would see Jesus, you would see a huge group of people. Now, you would think Jesus being at the height of his career, being at the top of his ministry, having this many people around, that in some ways you would think that he had arrived, his ministry had blossomed, this was a good day, but Jesus did not see it this way. Now, this is one of the points of the life and ministry of Jesus that we need to clear up. Crowds are around him. They hang on every word. They wait for every action. Jesus looks around at the crowds. And many people from the outside looking in would say he's at the top of his ministry. And Jesus looks around and says, I don't think these people are listening. And Jesus changes his tone. He changes his approach for the very reason not to keep the crowd, but to cut the crowd down to size, to sift out of the crowd who really is there to hear and to do and to follow and who is just there to hear. Listen, the world is never short of people who want to run to the, to, the, to the latest thing that has the biggest crowd. The world has never been short of that, nor will the world ever be short of that. But the world has always been short of people who really want to listen, who really want to pay attention, who really want to observe and to listen carefully to what is being said. And Jesus changes his tone. The way Jesus changes his tone is in the most interesting way. Jesus moves from teaching in a very straightforward way to teaching in, now you know this, maybe, in parables. The parable, the parables of Jesus, it's a form of teaching. A parable is simply this. It is an earthly story that conveys a spiritual truth. It's an earthly story that conveys a spiritual truth. Now, I have actually had very well-meaning church members, I mean, some years back now, very well-meaning church members come up to me and say, Rusty, you ought to use more stories when you preach because when, when Jesus taught, he used a lot of stories to make it really plain. And that only told me that the poor lady who was trying to tell me this didn't understand why Jesus told stories. See, the parables of Jesus are not to make it plain. The parables of Jesus were to make it vague. The parables of Jesus were not to reveal. The parables of Jesus were primarily to conceal, not to make it obvious to anybody, but to, to, to cloak the teaching that Jesus was trying to state. Let me, get, let me illustrate this point. Imagine if I was teaching in a very straightforward way. Today, I want you to know five things, and I laid them out. Here they are, and I gave them to you. And then the next Sunday, I come to the pulpit, and this is what I do for the Sunday morning sermon. You ready? I stand up and I say, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collects every type of fish, and when it is full, it's dragged to the shore. You gather the good fish into one container and the worthless fish in another container. Let us pray. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you connect with the story, but you don't know what the story means other than Is he telling us what he did over the weekend? Or if I stood up and I said, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. And I've sent out servants to invite people to the banquet. But each one that I invited to the banquet had an excuse. One said, um, I've bought a field and must go see to it. Another said, I have five yoke of oxen, I must try them out. Another said, I just got married and unable to come, and the, and the one who invited became angry. He said, go out and just get anybody you can get so that my wedding banquet is full. Let us pray. You understand what I'm talking about? Well, you are kind of with the story, you understand? But without further explanation, without understanding why I'm giving the story, you don't have any idea why I am stating it. And Jesus' teaching changes. You know what Jesus is waiting on? Because I could, I, I'm not, I wish, I almost got gutsy this, this morning and did something really crazy, but you know what, I might miss the whole point. Um, the whole point was I'd preach something so opaque and see if most people, probably most people, I'd preach something so opaque, nobody have the foggiest idea what I'm talking about, and most of you would have gone on to Sunday school and said, no, nah, nice sermon. And quite frankly, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. They go, well, you know, the Galilean preacher is kind of doing something different down there on the hills. But, you know, the fish story, that's kind of cool. That wedding story banquet thing, I don't know what he's talking about, but I mean, I could get it, you know. I don't know who would not go to the wedding banquet. Maybe he's got something against weddings, but, you know. All right, well, let's just keep on going. You know what Jesus waited on? He waited to see the people who hung around after service to say, what in the world are you talking about? And Jesus says, well, finally, somebody's listening. He says, now for you, I'll tell you what I was really trying to say. And Jesus, by the way, you understand, we're not too many weeks now from Easter week. By the time Jesus gets to the cross, he is alone, which really means even the ones who wanted to hear missed the main point. Now, they figure it out after the resurrection, but from here in the life and ministry of Jesus to the cross, Jesus doesn't keep attracting the crowd, he starts cutting the crowd down because he wants the ones who remain to really be there, not just to be a part of the new phenomenon that is the teacher of Galilee, but the ones who are there because they really want to be his disciples. Now, if you want, let's go to one of the famous parables, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, which really not only is a parable, but encapsulates in so many ways the point of the parables that Jesus is u uses. Matthew 13. Now just listen for the things that I've talked about and see how they appear even in this uh, uh, series of verses. All right, here we go. Verse 1, it says, On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down, while the whole crowd stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky ground, where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Anyone who has ears should listen. The parable. Now watch the interaction, verse 10. 
Then the disciples came up and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, the listeners, but it has not been given to them, the ones who don't know that they need to listen. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. For this reason I speak to them in parables, because looking, they do not see, and hearing, they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, yet Uh, yet never understand. You will look and look, yet never perceive. For this people's hearts have grown callous, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise they may might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn back, and I would cure them. But your eyes are blessed because they do see, and your ears because they do listen. For I assure you, Many prophets and righteous people long to see the things you see, yet didn't see them. To hear the things you hear, yet didn't hear them. You then listen to the parable of the sower. Now he says, I'm going to tell you what it means. He says, when anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When the pressures or persecution come because the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the seduction of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who, who does bear fruit and yield some 100, some 60, some 30 times what is sown. Let's get the parable in view. There it is. Now I want to make a few technical statements about parables. Then I'm going to explain the parable, and then we're going to apply the parable, and quite frankly, then see who is listening. Good. <laughs> okay, so the parables, just to, just to put these in context, the parables are not true stories. Jesus makes them up. They're not true stories. They're true-to-life stories. Understand? They're true-to-life. They connect with what you do. Was there an actual sower that Jesus was thinking about who went to sow? No. Jesus is making up Illustrations, you understand? He's making up illustrations because he wants to deliver a spiritual punch if the people are willing to hear it. So the parables aren't true stories, they're true to life stories. They connect with the audience because everybody can capture the image of what these stories are talking about. So maybe we have a little bit of distance. If I was preaching in parables today, I would say a food manufacturer got on a tractor and started taking a something or another, whatever, a piece of equipment and pressing beans into the ground. You understand the parable would change because a true-to-life story about a farmer is a little different than a true-to-life story about a farmer 2,000 years ago, but not so much that you can't get the point. You understand? So Jesus gives a true-to-life story. Now, if you missed it, I'm just going to give it to you again, and I'm going to hold this image in front of you, because what you have to do is every point of the parable will, in a moment, I'm going to show you a screen in a moment, but not at this moment, I'll show you a screen where every point in the parable is then connected to a spiritual application or analogy that Jesus is making. So it's very important to listen to how Jesus tells the story because then he's going to connect the story to another truth. And this is the way all the parables work. Some parables are really simple, one point. Some parables are pretty complicated, two points. And this is the big one. I mean, this is like the most complex of all the parables, the parable of the sower and the soils, because quite frankly, he has a lot of points he wants to make from this parable. You get the point. So here's the thing. One of the things we should notice when Jesus tells this story is that in the parable of the sower and the soils, he doesn't focus on the sower primarily. He focuses on the 
soils. And he actually tells us four types of soils, which he doesn't... Why does he... Be very careful when you read the parables to notice which details Jesus puts the highlight on because that's where he wants to make the application. He just merely tells us that a person is sowing. You hand in the ancient world, and even I've hand-sown fertilizer but not seeds. Uh, so um, nevertheless, but the, the sower is hand-sowing. And in any garden, you have the ground. By the way, they didn't have... Um, modern equipment where they could till up the soil, so you just dig it up the best you could, and then you just throw the seed as best you could and try to hit the right spots. Well, four soils that the, that the seed hit, Jesus says. One, the path, and notice what happens. When it hits the path, the seed stays on top of the soil and the birds eat it. That's the first one. The second one is this, among the rocks, and then the sun scorches it, it doesn't have, it pops up, it makes a fruit, and then the sun scorches it and it doesn't have enough root, it dies. The third one is among the weeds or the thorns, and it comes up but then gets choked out, and finally the good soil in which the seed produces multiple fruit. Now I want you to notice, before I, make, before I move from this to the application, I want you to notice, and I've made this point already once, I'm going to make it again and then I'm not going to make it anymore, here it is. When Jesus tells this parable, the disciples do not run up to Jesus and go, Oh, Jesus, great messages today. We really love the stories. I mean, you're really helping us here. Uh, we're so enthusiastic about this new way of teaching. You know what they walk up to Jesus and say? Why do you talk to them like this? That's their question. What happened to the good old Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. What happened to the good straightforward five points? Come on, what happened to it, Jesus? We're, we don't like this. And Jesus actually tells them, I mean, if you were listening to the text that I just read, he tells them, because I want to see who's actually listening. Because here, the parables of Jesus are really an act of his grace. I'm going to tell you this, and then we're going to apply it. By the way, let this be a warning for all of us. God judges us in a very simple way. This is another message, but I can give you the point. God judges us. He looks at us and he says, how much did you know? And how well did you respond? That's the way he judges us. How much did you know? And how well did you respond? Now, some of you are putting yourself in a precarious situation. I mean, we're really glad you're coming to church every week. You understand? But every week you know more, and the response stays the same. Jesus isn't okay with that. He wasn't okay with it in his earthly ministry, and he's not okay with it today. And God looks at us. I mean, when we stand before him, he'll just say, what did you know? Well, I knew all of this. He's like, that's it? That's all you did about it? And I can make quite a few points. Quite frankly, the, the, the people who got the greatest condemnation were the places, I'll give you two of them in the Gospels, Bethsaida and Chorazin got the greatest condemnation by Jesus. He said it would be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. Now, may I say Bethsaida and Chorazin, they were probably more moral places than Sodom and Gomorrah, but they got a full, a full picture of Jesus and just rejected him. And Jesus said, no, no. How much did you know and how well did you respond? And thus, this is the point of the parables. Jesus is, so Jesus says, listen, I know these people don't even want to know, so I'm not going to keep telling them. He says, I'm not going to just keep heaping on them condemnation, more information, more information, more information, more information, and, and, to just, and just their guiltiness of not doing it will go up and up and up and up. He says, I'm going to back off. Even that is an act of his grace. Nevertheless, so now he makes the points. He's going to take the four soils, and he's going to put them into four responses. Now I have this chart, and I'll 
pull it up on the screen. Hopefully you can read that. Yep, I think you can. If not, put your bifocals on. Or your, uh, I can tell you what's on the screen. Nevertheless, four soils. Here are the four responses, all right? Up in the, uh, the ones who fall on the path. There is, the, let's, let's make some points. The sower, we don't really know the sower is God or Jesus. You understand? He's the one who's pitching out the seed. The seed is the word about the kingdom of heaven or the gospel. The soils are the heart. Jesus is going to make all these points. The sower is God. The seed is the word of God or the gospel or the message about the kingdom. And the soils are the heart. The focus is not on that middle block, but on the four blocks around it. Okay, so the path. The path is the, the word, the word of God sown on a hard heart. This is the what does this person do with what they hear. They don't hear. They're clueless about what's coming at them, and they have no response. And the Bible says that Satan comes and he just steals the word. You know what? Um, there are some people in this, even, even this community, and I'm not trying to, I'm not calling names. I've sat down with them, and, and they'll usually put up a big intellectual argument to me, and I'll even make what they even say are intellectual points to their objections. It doesn't move them one bit. Nah, don't, I don't believe in God. Don't want to talk to him about him. Mm -mm. And, and usually what I find out when I push that person, they're mad at God for some reason or another. Well, he hasn't treated me right. This, is, this such and such has happened. And pastor, I just don't hear it. Quite frankly, I don't care. Both lamps on both tables could levitate. And God could say, I just did it. And it would be like, man, I don't hear it. And Jesus says, well, that's one response. He said, just a hard heart. You know, maybe you're here today. Um, it's always fun because, you know, I usually am out and about between services. So it's always nice to see the people out you know, just frolicking around, you know, between services. And, you know, and, and it's like surprises them. I'm out on the sidewalk, hey, how you doing? They're like, oh, it's Sunday. <laughs> like, I, I need to run a little later on Sunday, you understand? <laughs> I need to get, you know, so I'm like, hey. <laughs> and, and then, and I'm not saying that this is the case for every one of them. I say, you're gonna get you're gonna think about spiritual things anytime? Mm -mm. No, I don't want I don't I don't talk about that. Jesus says there's one response. Just the so seed on the path. But then Jesus gives two other in, inappropriate responses. He then talks about the 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 rootless, the one thrown on the rocks. You know, to be honest with you, I've I've been around um, being around people and who've made responses to different things. Uh, listen, I'm all for, I am, I am, by the way, very pro the proper use of emotion. I think if you have a relationship and you don't have emotion, it's a pretty bad relationship, you understand? Uh, it's like, get with the program, uh, you know what I'm saying? So a relationship without emotion is a problem. I'm like, a big problem, okay? Uh, there ought to be appropriate affections for God. But notice what this, this second response is not a right affections. It's just kind of a, the message is sown, and then the person is, woo, yeah, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus. Praise God, I'll be a disciple of Jesus. I'll be a disciple of Jesus. They're not counting the cost. They're not paying attention. They do this about everything. You know what I'm saying? Everything. They're woo, woo, woo about everything that happens in life. And then all of a sudden, they walk out, somebody says, you're going to church, you're a Christian? They're like, well, is that a bad thing? You're like, well, yeah, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. Oh, I'm out. <laughs> and then that same person on the next thing, they're doing the next diet, they're on the next financial plan, they're helping with this cause only to forget that they help with that cause, they help with the other cause, they're just a rootless person. 
They're just like, a, they just pop around. And Jesus says, yeah, there's another one. I call this like the inappropriate emotional response. It's almost, I remember in every one of the big, in every one of like the big youth rallies that I ever did and a lot of the big things, every one of them would have at least five people at that service would be cut to the core, come to the altar, fall out, cry, sob, do all this stuff. And I'm not saying praise God for response, you understand? And then I would say, yes, praise God, this person, they got it, they're going to move forward. And then two weeks later, I'd call them up and say, hey, man, that response. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? I said, man, you're at the altar two weeks ago. You were cut in half. I mean, you were ready to change your life. Oh, yeah, man, a lot of stuff's happened since then. What are you talking about? A lot of stuff has happened since then. I think, oh, yeah, a lot of stuff's happened. I mean, that was a good night, though. It's a good night. What is, I don't even know, just. (laughs) Come on, if you've been around church life, you've seen it. Can I get a witness? I mean. Jesus said, that ain't a disciple either. You understand? It's not a disciple either. And then he says another one. Another person. Boy, there's a, there's a lot of these on the table. Who, who the word takes root. I mean, they're really, they're really ready to go. They're ready to move forward in discipleship. And, and man, they're with it. They're with it. They're with the program for like six weeks. Maybe they're with the program for like six months. And then, well, then, then they got to work a few extra hours at the, at the job. Okay, you know, life happens. Well, then, then the kids got something to do. Okay, all right. You know, stuff happens. You got to be there for the kids appropriately. You know, then, then, then they need to take a few vacations. All right, you ought to take a break from time to time. But then I don't see them anymore. And, I, and then I run into them in town. I say, you know, what's going on, man? You know, I'm working like crazy, and kids are doing stuff. And I mean, I'm just, I, you know, we, we, went, we went away for two or three weeks, had to clear our heads. And you coming back? You going to get with the discipleship program? Yeah, I need to get back. You're right. I think they're genuine. But what happened? The word got choked out. And Jesus says, there's only a small group. There's only a small group who digs up the rocky soil of their heart and just says, God, I want to stick with it. Let me tell you something. Discipleship is not a moment. It is a process. It's a process. we got to work at this. We have to keep digging up the rocks out of our soul. We have to keep pulling the weeds. We have to get, keep with this program. And quite frankly, I cannot imagine, I like to envision at this moment, If we were to encounter the living Christ at this moment, I can't imagine that today he's not really wanting to ask us the question, are you really listening? Are you keeping with the program? Are you tilling the soil of your heart? Are you pulling up the weeds? By the way, every one of us on our discipleship journey are going to get off track just going to happen. We're not going to all be super saints. None of us would be super saints, you know, maybe one or two, but it would be the minority. You understand? The, the way we do it is we just keep with the program. And actually, I'll just say, the, the people in my life that I know who are disciple, true disciples are just the ones who just, who just keep showing up, who just keep praying, who just keep reading, who just keep serving. That's what Jesus says, right? The end of the Sermon on the Mount. How are we going to do all of this? He says, just keep praying, just keep seeking, just keep knocking, and the door will be open. This is a process. You know what? I put this final image up today. I wonder if the living Christ would encounter you today and right there in your seat and just ask you the simple question. You listening? 
Jesus knows something every great teacher knows. There's a very small group that listens. There's an even smaller group that hears. There's an even smaller group that does. And there's an even smaller group that perseveres in their doing. And Jesus, Jesus' point was to make disciples and not make a crowd. He wants to make his great commission to make disciples of all the nations. That's what is going to be some of his final words. But may I say, to call people to discipleship, you and me have to be involved in that process. And the best teacher of discipleship is not a sermon, but a life, a pattern. And we model for people a sensitive heart, that sticks with the plan. And so church family, this is my appeal to you today. Let's just go for a discipleship. Let's, let us be the crowd that hangs around after Jesus is done to ask him the question, Jesus, what do you mean? I want to follow you. And Jesus, at that moment, here's the thing, I really believe that if you in your heart just say, God, I want to know you. And you don't just say it today at Sunday morning and forget about it, but tomorrow morning you say, God, I want to know you. And the next day you say, God, I want to know you. And the next day you say, God, I want to know you. Dig up the rocks of my soul, pull the weeds out of my spirit. God, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. Do it. God will make himself known. He'll make himself real. He'll make himself available. And he'll transform you. But that is the heart hardest thing you're going to have to do to just stay with it and may we be the ones here's the thing the disciples could stay with Jesus right up to the moment until it really mattered remember in two weeks Jesus will die alone it's because Jesus is already preparing them and they're not able to hear. Church family, let's, let's hear this message. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you say, what do I do? You, some of you today have never for the first time received the gospel. If your heart today is ready to receive it, all you have to say is, God, I admit I'm a sinner. God, by faith, I trust in Jesus. And the Bible says you'll become a Christian if you need to do that, I'll be right up here at the front. But for those of us who are Christians, are we hearing, doing, following? You get the point. Let's ask God about it. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make us your disciples in every way. God, that we would be the group that hangs around after the message is over. Not, um, well, we hang around for the message is over because we want to do the message. We want to be with you. We want to know you. We want to follow you. And so, God, today, if there are inappropriate responses, if our heart has become hardened, if our, if our heart is indecisive, we don't know if you are God or if something else is God, and we run around and chase all various forms of things we give our full allegiance to and forget that you're the only one that gets total allegiance. God, if our schedule is choking out, doing what you want us to do, following this discipleship way. May we hear the first discipleship call and leaving everything behind, they followed him. And so, God, today we pray you would help us on this discipleship journey, that you would communicate to us through the Holy Spirit of God in these moments that which we not only need to hear, but that you would be clear to us on how we need to respond. May we not be an unresponsive people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again.
pray that you would just develop in us a heart ready to receive your word. God, none of us in this room today have the answers, the direction, the thoughts that we need. But God, we believe through the voice of the Holy Spirit that if we would just allow our hearts to be open to your word, that you would guide us, direct us, teach us, transform us. And so, God, in this place and in these moments and in my heart and in the hearts of people, God, may we not attempt to know all that we need to know but trust in the one who does and have a heart willing to receive it and to obey it and to do it in the moments in which you tell us to do it, and thus may we become your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.